I do have two you thousand. Want? When, whenever. Yeah. Okay. How are you? <laughs> All right. Well, Peter Himes, uh, now that uh, we have kind of established a link between the fact that my former boss, Bill Vance, uh, is a friend of yours. I guess you all worked together in Chicago, right. didn't you? Yeah. Uh, you were doing television and... No, he was the city editor. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, so I know that he'll be very curious to see this film, but uh, let, me, let me start out by finding out for sure now. Was Kubrick asked to do this or not? I don't know. You don't know? No. Because... Uh, if I was him, I would have asked him. Uh, because uh, I haven't been able to, to nail it down whether he just had served notice he wasn't interested or whether they asked him and he turned it down or what. I really don't know. Okay. Uh, and the fact is also, if I believe some of the things I read and hear, that originally you didn't want to do it. Is that right? Some of the things you read and hear are true. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I absolutely flat out didn't want to do it. I was thought the idea was horrifying. Um, I, for the obvious reasons, you know, Kubrick is, is my idol. I think he's the greatest director in the world. Last thing in the world I'd want to do is to have my work compared to Kubrick's. Uh, I mean, that's like somebody who does graffiti having their work compared to Picasso. Uh, and, th and then the man in charge of MGM, a man named Frankie Blonde, said, well, read the book. Why don't you read the book before you say no? And there was a certain kind of scary logic in that. So I read the book, and it was when I read the end of the book that I, I saw there was a chance to make a movie that was so unlike 2001. I mean, so diametrically opposite to it in style, in content, in intent, that you couldn't compare the films. You actually couldn't compare the films. And that there was a chance to make a film that rather than being a kind of sequel, was a film that completely stood on its own and did not require having seen 2001. I actually set out to make a film for people who haven't seen 2001. Um, that's when I said I'd do it, because it just was a chance to make a film that is unique in the sense that it's a film for the heart. You know, it's a film that, that's going for more than just your eyes, um, and that seemed worth it. So what you're saying then, Peter, is that uh, Kubrick's 2001 didn't influence your picture at all. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's not a matter of influencing. It's a matter of they are so dissimilar that you can't make relative comparisons. You have to take the film totally by itself, as if it was not preceded by anything, and say, this film works or doesn't work. This film is compelling or it's not compelling. It's exciting or it's boring or it's, it's touching or it leaves me cold. Uh, it works or it doesn't work. Did you understand the ending to 2001? Did I understand it? Yeah. Few people do. I don't know if it's a matter of really understanding it. I mean, I, it's hard for me to say in hindsight because I've done some reading, uh, and 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 so I kind of know what it means now. No, I didn't really understand it then. Except I don't know if that was important. I sure felt something when I saw it, and I think that's what he was trying for. I think one of the most talked about scenes in 2010 will be the arrow breaking scene. And could you just discuss that a little bit about, uh, you know, how you did it and what you were trying to achieve and, and its place in the film? Well, it's the first, well, no, I'm sorry, it's the second real effect sequence in the film. If this is a story about a group of Russians and Americans who are forced to go together on a space shot, and it is a time of great uh, antipathy between the two countries, and as a result, the two crews don't really get along very well. They're reflective of what's going on. And during this scene, Roy Scheider and a, a young Russian girl are both scared out of their minds together. And they go through this really horrific, uh, yet necessary maneuver to slow down, which is frankly astronomically correct. It is what they will do. That is a, it is a technique called air breaking, where you actually use the atmosphere of a planet and slingshot around. And by cutting through the atmosphere, you slow yourself down because one of the great problems in long-range space travel is the conservation of fuel. Uh, and in going through that together and experiencing the kind of panic that's involved in it, that's the first real breakthrough uh, between the groups. And it's the first real thaw 
between the two groups. So that the, the point of the sequence was A, to be this roller coaster ride, and B, to, to emotionally start the process that the film ultimately goes through. The movement, was it camera movement or were you moving set and people or both? Both. Both. I mean, big sets were shaken. They were on, they were on the hydraulic jacks and, and the camera was, was mounted on a piece of equipment that also moved. Um, it was a fairly violent sequence. And how long did this go on? Days or? Oh, the whole sequence took uh, two, three weeks to film. I think, Peter, one of the impressive things about it, and maybe this um, does or doesn't impress audiences, but the fact that for the kind of big film you have, you didn't have that big a budget. Is it, it wasn't a 25 million? 24. 24 million, okay. And you, you just shot gave me a million dollars. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> See how generous yeah. I am. And, and the shooting schedule was 70, how many days? 73 is something what I like read. That. It was February okay. 6th to May something. But what did that impose, uh, those kinds of, of limitations? Uh, were they limitations? Could you have gone bigger and better and wider with more money and more time? Maybe somebody more talented than I am could have. I mean, that's no joke. I couldn't have. I just think you have to set parameters for yourself, and you have to work inside those parameters. And I think there's something about the struggle against those limits that makes you better. I think it's... I, th I think that if there are people like me who, if they said, okay, take as much time as you want and there are no limits and as much money as you want to spend, I would probably sit there and wind up sucking my thumb for about a year. And if someone says, this has to be in this theater on X date, you have this amount of money and this amount of time to make it, now go do it and stop complaining, that's the way I can work. Well, the end result is wonderful, Peter. Oh, I must tell you, I you. thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Should be a big hit for you. And I thank Hope you so. very much for this opportunity to talk My with pleasure. you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Okay. Now, feeling? questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have the feeling she knows. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> Call it instinct. I just <laughs> have the feeling this lady knows. Okay. Peter, is it true that at first you turned down the opportunity to direct this film? What changed your mind? Are you saying then that Kubrick's 2001 did not influence your picture? Given the time restraints and the budget restraints, even though it was a pretty hefty budget, uh, if you could have had bigger and better, would it have changed your film? Supposing you'd had all the time you wanted and all the money you felt you needed, what would have happened? Discuss for us the arrow breaking scene. What were you trying to accomplish here? In the arrow breaking scene, what was it? Camera moving and set and people moving or what? And now I'll just give you reaction. <laughs> okay, thank you.